Hey everyone out there, my name is Mark Heaps and I will be your instructor for this session at Adobe Max 2020. And this session is called The Essential Tricks for Designers in Adobe Photoshop. And so during this session, we're gonna be covering a lot of different techniques on workflow, gaining some efficiencies for your production best practices, trying to reduce some of that stress that comes from when you have to take a particular task and repeat it over a large array of assets and how to work better with your teams through some of these alternate approaches to editing. So let's just call it that. Down here at our design agency, we do a lot of work in the presentation media space and supporting communication groups at large corporations. So whether that's designing presentations, building infographics, looking at UI, UX, making videos, um, or just really doing anything with a communications marketing group, we have a lot of graphic production. And so one of the challenges around graphic production is how do you make sure that one, everybody on your team is being consistent, and two, that you are making it not a laborious or really involved process every time you wanna create a certain type of look and feel. So if, uh, if this is your first Adobe Max, welcome. If this is a repeat for anyone that's been in my sessions in the past, thank you so much for coming back. I really appreciate you doing that. And if you wanna be in touch with me uh, and connect and ask any questions after this session, you can reach me on all of my social media platforms, which is Twitter, Instagram, and most importantly, the facebook.com slash lifebypixels. So at lifebypixels is my name everywhere and you'll be able to reach me there and see other questions and techniques that people post on our page. Outside of that, you can also reach me at markheaps.com. Okay, so let's talk about this first scenario. Imagine you're working on something like a magazine or maybe it's a website or some kind of campaign and it's just got photographs all throughout the project. And suddenly you get a change from your art director or your client that says, hey, we don't wanna do solid color photographs all the way through this piece. In fact, I want you to take advantage of, in this case, the blue that we're using. I'll send you a sample. But now you have to replicate that over a massive array of your images. So I'm gonna show you an alternate way of handling that from start to finish. So here's an exact scenario that I've received so many times in the past where an art director or someone has sent me a sample file like this. Here's one of the photos from that magazine spread. And you can see in here that we've got a couple of layers going on above the image layer. So above this converted image layer, we've got a conversion to black and white. And it looks like they've reduced the opacity to 50%. So if that was all the way up, this would look like a grayscale image. But they've reduced this down to 50%, really just to desaturate the image. That's a technique I see people using a lot versus actually learning how saturation works in hue, saturation, brightness. They just wash it out using a black and white layer. And then you see another layer like this, which is just a solid filled layer. It's not actually a color layer. It's a traditional regular transparent layer that they just filled with their color of choice. And then they've set the blend mode on this layer from normal to multiply. So there's nothing really wrong with this technique, right? They're getting the effect that they want. It looks the way that they want. And they've been able to communicate their design idea to me as the production artist for what they want. So where's the foul? Well, this is gonna get a little bit more involved as we start incorporating this over multiple images throughout our project. Now, that's not necessarily really hard if we're doing one project where we want this to be something that we could run maybe an action on into a batch process. But what if you're working with multiple designers on multiple parts of a campaign and you're spread out all around the world? Now you need to start thinking about this as if you're making a toolkit. So let's take a look at an alternate way of doing this. So I'm gonna turn these first two layers off, just we don't need them anymore. We're gonna come down to our image layer here, and we're gonna use something you've probably used dozens if not hundreds of times before, right? And we call these layer styles down here at the effects button at the bottom of the layers panel. So we choose this, and the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna use color overlay. And this is what it looks like traditionally for you if you've never messed with duplicating any of your layer styles within the styles panel. So in here, we're gonna use a color overlay, right? And you can see my last setting was the blue, just like uh, they were using on their layer, but we're doing it through a layer style. So 
If we wanted to actually add that black and white effect in here, what we could do first and foremost is set this to normal. Let's put it up to 100% so you can see it. And then I'm gonna change this color to any shade of gray, basically a completely desaturated along the left edge of the color picker shade of gray. Now, when we press OK here, that doesn't look very good, right? It's not very effective. But if we change the blend mode from normal to color, look at this. You actually get a grayscale image. Now you're probably thinking, well, why would I do that when I could just do that with a black and white adjustment layer? This becomes clear when we start thinking about how to create toolkits. So let's leave that one set like that to start with. We might reduce it down to somewhere, I think it was somewhere around 65%. I'm gonna make sure I type that number in there because I like clean numbers. If you sat in my classes before, you know, I'm really pushy about making sure simple numbers, clean math. Now, to get that blue um, color effect, we're just gonna press the plus symbol down here in the styles area and add a secondary color overlay. Now, if you wanted a punchier grayscale image, you could now use something like multiply or color burn. But what we wanna do is use that blue from earlier. So. We actually still have that blue right there. I'm just gonna sample it. You could also paste in the hex code, which I had copied from our project. Press okay. And now instead of using color on this, the art director was using multiply. So we'll just click on that. And then again, we could go back and look at their layers and see what their opacity was and make sure we're using the right number here. But I think that's right, 65%. We can always press okay come back in here and turn on this layer and check it. Ah, actually, it was 80%. That seems really, really, really high, but let's go in there and make a quick change to that. Okay, so now we've got that one. Let's check our black and white layer as well. Oh, it was set to 50%. Okay, so let's go back to color overlay and we're gonna set this one to 50%. All right, so now we've managed to replicate the look and feel that they had using multiple layers, but now we've done it as a series of layer style components. And there's a lot of things you can do with layer styles if you think about using them differently. But for right now, we're using this to create a photo treatment. As we're using this, what we wanna do now is think about how to make it replicable. Now, we could, let me, uh, let me go back over to Adobe Bridge here where we've got some other photographs. Let me just show you one particular technique. If I open this image, which is also from the magazine, so we'll just say open with Adobe Photoshop. Here's another image. Well, I can tab over to the first image and I can right click on this little effects area and say copy layer style, which means when I go back to the new image, as soon as we click on the lock and convert it to a regular layer, we could right click and say paste layer style. And that very quickly brings those values over and applies the appearance properties to this image. So in this particular instance, using the layer style gives us this consistency we want but more so than actually copying and pasting the layer style, which works great for one image at a time, what if I wanted to share that particular property with all the members of my team? So you may be thinking, yeah, this is easy enough. I'll save this as a Photoshop document and I will post this up on our server and everyone will download it and they'll all work based on this file, right? Because you've created this appearance using layer styles, you could come up to window, Come on down to where it says styles. And then in here, you can create your own custom styles. Now, let me show you what update was made here. So I've created a new styles group and I've named it magazine styles. Uh, you do that just by pressing the little group button down here. And then because we have this layer targeted in the layers panel, when we press the layer button, what it's gonna actually do is create a new style. So I'm gonna call this magazine photo blue treatment, right? And then as the options in here, oh, let me fix that name there. For the options in here, you can see that it says include layer effects. Now there's an, also an option here for include layer blending options. And that's really important depending on some appearances that you create, because not only will it remember the layer styles that you've added, but it also um, will save the opacity, the blend mode, the blend if sliders, your knockout groups, all kinds of settings that are related to that particular layer. So if you wanna just replicate the appearance property of a layer, you could do that by creating a new style. Now here's the other part that is interestingly new and important. You can choose to add to my current library. And what this means is I'm gonna add this style 
to my creative cloud library, which is something that you can share with your teams. So if we check that box and press OK, you can see here in the styles panel, there's actually this little square here and I'm just going to drag this into the magazine styles, turn that down and now you can see I've got this swatch. But also if I go over to libraries and I'm currently in the Adobe Max library, you can see there is my style. So it says magazine photo blue treatment, which means I could take this and using Creative Cloud libraries, connect it with my team and we can share that way. So how do we use it? Well, once it's added in here, if you're if you're newer to using Photoshop, right, we can actually go back over to Adobe Bridge. Let's take this image and open it in Adobe Photoshop. And I use Adobe Bridge for all of my asset management. I just find it works really easy. It's very reliable and it connects to more than just photographs. So here we are in uh, this new image, right? Well, you'll notice if I click on a style, it doesn't work. And the reason for that is this is a flattened background layer and you can't have layer styles or effects on a background layer. So let me click the lock here. That converts it to a regular layer. And then when I click the layer style, boom, that treatment has been applied. So this makes it very, very fast. The numbers are consistent. And so now that everyone on my team could have access to this via their Creative Cloud library, they would simply bring that out of the library. It gets added to their styles panel and they could convert any image they want to this particular appearance. Again, it's very, very easy to edit, but the bulk part of the work has been done up front. Now, um, before I talk a little bit further of why this is so advantageous in a group work environment, um, I wanna show you some other things that you could do with these styles to speed up your workflow. So for example, I'm gonna trash the ones that we just added and just show you a couple of examples of other things that I've done. So for example, here's a layer style that I've created and I've added to my own group called Mark's Custom Styles. And you can see here, it's added this white strip across the bottom. And this is actually, even though it looks like a white strip, it's actually a gradient overlay. But what we've done is we've set the gradient to be solid white up until a middle point and then transparent on the other side. So there's no blending, it meets at the exact same coordinate. And this is really, really handy because once you have this made, you could move this, uh, this gradient around inside of your document and set the positional height for your image, which means anytime I need that white bottom trim, I can open any photograph up, click on that button, and it adds the bottom trim for me. Here's another one. This one actually adds that gradient overlay across the bottom like you just saw, but then I'm also using a stroke here, which is set to a large number right now. You can see I could make this smaller if I wanted to, but this gives me sort of a Polaroid frame effect, right? And so anytime I want that appearance on a photograph, I simply open it up, I click on that style, immediately it's added for me. So you can imagine if you can create particular appearances as a toolkit for your jobs and make them using layer styles, this could speed up your workflow a lot and also make you consistent with your team members. Okay. So let's go back to the next part of why this matters. And we're gonna start talking about how to process a large array of images using that style. One thing that I did forget to mention earlier is that if you're using styles, it's worth noting that when you click on a layer style and you already have existing styles on the layer, they will replace and overwrite those style uh, appearance properties. So for example, whether I grab it from the styles panel or over here in my Creative Cloud library, when I click on the style we made earlier, it's going to remove that Polaroid frame and replace it with the photo magazine blue treatment that we created. So that's something to be aware of. Um, but if you are using a style, here it is in my library, you can also invite a user, I forgot to mention this earlier, if you, by just pressing this button. So this will give you the option to invite to Adobe Max 2020 and it's using the Creative Cloud desktop app to invite them um, to have access to your library. So then they could access that style and you could work collaboratively on your project. So just put their Adobe user ID in here, choose can edit and then invite them. All right, so let's look at the next important part here in Photoshop. So we are going to close all of this out. We're gonna get rid of it, don't save. All right, they're all closed. So let's open one of these photos again. So let's bring this into Photoshop, here it is. Now, 
you're probably thinking to yourself, if I need to apply this to a lot of images for that magazine project, that's easy, I'm gonna use an action. And if you've ever played with actions before, they're really, really handy. But let's, let's give a quick overview for people that have never used it before. So actions, which you can find here under the window, come down to actions, is basically kind of a linear recorder. When you're making edits, it's recording step by step all the edits that you make that are relative to controls inside of Adobe Photoshop. And then when you want to apply that same process or that recipe again, you can literally play the action on a new file and it repeats step by step by step by step, right? And sometimes those actions can be very lengthy and very involved and it can take a long time for Photoshop to open your image, launch every single panel, change the settings, press OK, move to the next step, and follow the recipe as if you were doing it yourself. We're gonna do something slightly different. So here we are in our actions uh, panel. Now, one thing that's worth noting is we can't do the effect, the layer style, to a flattened layer. So we need to record in our action converting a background layer into a regular layer. So we'll go in here and we're gonna create a new action group and we'll call this magazine um, styles, okay, press okay. And we're gonna add a new action. And same thing, we'll call this magazine photo blue and we'll press record. And you'll see when it's recording, we get a little record button. It's gonna record step by step. So this time we're gonna click on the lock, convert that to a regular layer, and then here's the key difference. Instead of going through all those steps like the sample file that was given to us where you make a new layer, fill it with a blue, use a black and white adjustment layer, set the blend mode, set the opacity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those extra steps in the process have been added to our layer style. So instead of going through all that, we're simply gonna go over here and click on our layer style. Again, you can do it from the library or you can do it from your styles panel. But when you click on this, it's gonna add those. And now if we go back to our actions panel, we can actually see here that it has recorded those steps. So let me press stop. You can see set background, that means it's converting it to a regular layer. And then apply style magazine photo blue. And so you can see to current layer with group. And that means that's all of the instruction in the action. There's none of the linear process of all the in-between steps. It doesn't need to know what the opacity or the blend mode is because those options have been set in the layer style. So now if you had to batch process thousands of images, you're literally cutting out all of those in-between steps that take up so much processing power and can really bog down your machine. So now we can do this to all of our images using a slightly different technique than actions. Let me show you what that will be. Okay, so let's apply this to the entire job, right? I'm gonna close this one out, don't save, because again, we now have our layer style and our action. Now, for those of you familiar with actions, you're probably thinking, okay, he's gonna batch process this. And I am sort of, but not using the batch controller. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go up to file. Now you can do this in Adobe Bridge or Photoshop, but come down to scripts rather than choosing automate batch, and I'll show you why. I like to personally use scripts image processor. And the reason for this is one, it's a much simpler interface. So it's a little less confusing and I can choose my source folder. So here I've got the images from my magazine. I'm just gonna press open and choose that. And then where do you wanna save it? Well, I'm gonna to choose to save it in the same location. Here's the great part about image processor. It allows you to save as multiple file types like JPEGs, PSDs, or TIFF files. And you could also resize images. So if you ever wanted to run an action that creates a certain appearance and also change the size at the same time, you could do that here. Now we don't wanna do that in this case cause it's gonna align up with our magazine, but it's a handy feature. So down here in the bottom where it says preferences, I'm gonna to choose to run action and I'm gonna choose magazine styles, magazine photo blue. So I've got all the images in that folder and the right action. We're gonna press run. And remember, it's not gonna have to actually go through all of those steps that it would have done if we'd used the add a layer, change the color, set the blend mode, change the opacity, et cetera. This is literally opening the image, converting the layer to a regular layer, clicking the layer style, exporting it to a JPEG. And there it is, done. 
that's all of the images for our magazine. If we go look in Adobe Bridge, let's switch this over to our grid view here. So there's all the original photographs from the magazine. I'll double click on the JPEG folder and there they are all with their treatment. Now, this means that if we actually went back over to our magazine inside of InDesign here and we had an image like this, let's just go ahead and bring up our links here. There's all of the images. Well, if I go up here now and there's, there's lots of pages in this document you can see here all throughout the magazine. Now I can click on this, say relink to folder, and instead of linking to the original images, which are all here, we're gonna link to this JPEG folder. We'll choose this. And there you can see the photo has been updated inside of that. Well now, instead of doing just one, let's, uh, let's do all of them. So let's unselect that, click off, relink. Oh, you gotta have something selected. Let's select all of them. Go in here, relink to folder. There's the JPEG again, choose. It's thinking. And there you go. You can see it's relinked out throughout the entire magazine here in InDesign, setting those colors. So again, doesn't matter which page I'm on, it's updated with that new treatment. There might be a few things that I need to adjust here as far as some images that we didn't want to convert. I can always relink those back to the original folder, but this in a very quick way has allowed us to apply a treatment to the entire document with really what took setup on one graphic that we repeated across everything very quickly. All right, hopefully you found that helpful, knowledgeable, maybe a different way of thinking about how to work with Adobe Photoshop and using layer styles. Let's take a look at something else. If there was one other major thing I would want you to know as you're moving forward with Adobe Photoshop in production, um, and let's jump back over to Photoshop real quick, is start taking advantage of the new advancements in selection technology. So thanks to Adobe having machine learning, artificial intelligence known as Adobe Sensei, we can do some really trick things much more easily than we could in the past. For example, if I open this image of these dogs up, now this is not a straightforward, simple image. If someone said to me, hey Mark, I want you to select one of these dogs, in the past this would have taken a lot of time, at the very least to get started. So I wanna show you here real quick a couple of options. First, if I go up to select and just come down to where it says subject, you can see here that the algorithm that is the machine learning makes a guess at what it thinks the dog selection should be. And you can see in here, it's, it's pretty darn good. Let's just make a cutout, Command J. That makes a duplicate. That's not bad. That's a, that's a pretty good guess, but unfortunately, there's no actual way to isolate or tell it, hey, I wanted the dog in the middle or I wanted the dog on the far right because select subject is using machine learning to estimate what it's been taught is a dog or a set of dogs, in this case, the subject. Um, we could try something like select and choose focus area. The background's really out of focus. And this gives us a preview mode of how the selection would look as a layer mask. And you see it's doing a lot of thinking here. And we've got some controls of what's an in-focus or out-of-focus area, but that's actually a pretty good guess considering the ground plane here is in fact in focus. But if we really wanted to be able to isolate more effectively, you've got to come over to your selection tools and here where the magic wand would be um, and the quick selection tool, we now have the object selection tool. And this allows you to pseudo target an area either by using the lasso or the rectangle here under the object selection options. So instead of a rectangle, I'm gonna use the lasso so I can try to be somewhat more precise. Now you can see I'm not actually trying to trace the edge here, but what I'm trying to do is teach the machine learning component of this artificial intelligence where it needs to focus its comparison the most. So I'm just running up the edge here. Now there's some blown out areas on this image. There's a lot of fur detail. We would choose this, let it think, and there's my selection of the dog. So I could very, very quickly inverse that selection, go over to an image adjustment layer and choose black and white. And now you can see everybody else is black and white. Probably not the best decision considering the dog that we remained is black and white dog. <laughs> but you get the idea here, right? I could go in and actually use that selection to color cast everybody else in the image. Maybe we do something like a solid color. Here's our blue from earlier. 
choose color as a mode here. And you can see that one dog has been selected and is standing out. It's done a really good job. Let's look at the mask here and see how impressive that is. There's actually some texture and some blending going on. So again, that's one of those tricks that if you're not using these new selection features, make sure you spend some time playing with them. Look at the different options for the modes. Do you want to sample all layers? Do you want to enhance the edge? Um, object subtract as if there's holes and gaps within the area. This is really important. So that's another one that I think is an essential trick of a new feature for designers with Photoshop. For a very last tip, I just want to mention that if you are working between Adobe applications, your libraries are the fastest pipeline to efficiency between these programs. So just real quickly, if I was to go up to my library here, I'm going to shift click all of my layers with the work that we've done, and I'm just going to drag this. Um, actually, we can even just hit the plus symbol here and say add this graphic, right? So this is going to add the graphic for me. There it is as a PSD file inside of our library which means if we were going to a program like Adobe Illustrator and we went over to our libraries, you can see it's connecting. There's my color fill, right? There's my actual layer with my, my dogs here. So we'll bring this in. Let's just drag that in. Now the good thing is this is connected back to the Photoshop file. So if we were back in, let's just place that real quick. Let's make sure that that's, that's in there. If we go back to Photoshop, let's close this out. I don't need this anymore. You can actually see when I bring the library up, that PSD file is in here. Let's double click this. That opens it back up for me. And if we wanted to make a change, maybe we'll reduce the blue. And let's choose a different color. Let's do something like a yellowish green. And we hit save. That updates in the library. But now when we go back to Illustrator, it's also already updated. This is literally the fastest pipeline between your programs. Think about the advantage of this as well, because your teammate could be editing a graphic that is your layered PSD in the library while you're doing the layout in another program like Illustrator or InDesign, and they're making the changes that you want them to make, and it's automatically adjusting the link to the Creative Cloud library file. This is true collaboration in the fastest pipeline. Okay, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with me today. My name is Mark Heaps. Again, if you have questions, comments, or want to follow the work that I'm doing or other content that I'm teaching others, find me on social media at Life by Pixels. I hope you have a great Adobe Max. Check out my other session on Adobe Illustrator. And until then, happy clicking.